Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to, I, I always want to say good to see you. It's good to be here, and I hope it's good to see me. Um, I have not been in online service for uh, quite a few weeks now because of schedule and vacations in the summer, all those kinds of things, but it is good to be here and to worship with you today. A welcome to St. Matthew, whether you're a long timer or you're checking us out, you're a guest, uh, welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Michael Hansen, and I'll be leading us in worship today as we continue our journey through the story of Jonah. Um, but before we get into the rest of our worship, as always, we want to uh, just enjoy God's presence and call on him to be here and for us to be aware of that presence. And so we begin our service in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We welcome and worship God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We welcome and worship God, the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, who descended into hell, who rose again from the dead on the third day, who ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and will come to judge the living and the dead. We welcome and worship God the Holy Spirit, who brought us into the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, who gives us the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful worship. Thank you so, so, so much to our middle school choir. Uh, will you join me in prayer, everybody? Almighty God, you have spoken to us through your Son. Let your word now be spoken and heard by each of us. Give us ears to hear and hearts to understand, that we may not refuse your calling or ignore your voice. May we all be taught by you through your powerful word. Bring our every thought captive to obeying Christ, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our reading for today, our scripture is uh, from Jonah chapter 3. And uh, remember, Jonah has just been uh, vomited up by the giant fish onto land. And here's what happens once he gets back uh, out of the sea. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. 
Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going on a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, and covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let your people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring them to destruction that he had threatened. That's our scripture for today. And for all of you kids, uh, come on into the room, uh, get in front of the screen because our friend Beth is going to share a children's message with us. And here she is. Good morning, Beth. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're having a great day today on this beautiful Sunday morning. I know that I will be having a good day. Anyway, I have a question for you. How many of you are perfect kids? Mm, don't see a lot of hands, right? Here's another question. How many of you think I was a perfect kid? Well, guess what? If you raised your hand to either question, you'd be wrong. There's no such thing as a perfect person, right? Which is why today's lesson about a word called compassion is really important. Compassion, it sounds like a big, long, heavy duty word, doesn't it? You know what? Compassion means to be kind hearted, to have mercy, to show forgiveness. Now, who do we know that's really compassionate? That's right, God and Jesus. And last week's story about Jonah, you learned about compassion when God saved Jonah from drowning by having him scooped up in the belly of a whale until he could get carried to land. All right, so you're probably wondering, how's this lady talking about Jonah and why did she ask if we were perfect and if she was perfect? Well, here it comes. When I was about eight or nine, I was dusting at my mom's and dad's house, you know, where I grew up. And I knocked over this really expensive old bowl that my mom loved. And what should I have done right away? Because I broke the bowl. What should I have done? I should have gone and told my mom, I broke your bowl. I wasn't screwing around. I was doing my chores. I was dusting. No, not me. I was too scared. I was like, oh, she's going to be mad. And if I put it in the garbage, she's going to find it right away. What can I do? Oh, I know. I'll hide it. And I put it under this table that was in our family room thinking, mom will never find it there. Well, guess what? She knew pretty darn quickly that I had broken the bowl. And she asked me questions like, is there something you want to tell me? No. Did something happen while you were dusting? Oh, no. And ultimately, she kept giving me chance after chance. And finally, she's like, Elizabeth, I know what you did. And I was like, I'm sorry, Mommy. I broke the bowl. And she said, I know you did. And she said, yes, I'm upset about the bowl, but I'm angry that you would lie to me because you can't lie to your parents. And I was really sorry. And I thought maybe I'd get spanked or something, but she said, no, she goes, look, I love you. And I want you to never lie to me again. I am going to give you another chance. So mommy gave me another chance. She loved me enough to forgive me, to show compassion. And that was a really good lesson because when I grew up to be a mommy and when I grew up to be a teacher, I tried to show compassion. 
because my kids weren't perfect and heaven knows not all my students were perfect and I had to give more than one chance in the hopes that they would learn from that and they in turn would give people another chance because God gives us more than one chance. God has given us like a million chances and he still loves us. We're not perfect people and we do a lot of dumb things that make God unhappy, but he keeps giving us chances. And in fact, he did the best thing ever for us. He sent somebody to save us for our sin. Who did he send? That's right, he sent Jesus and Jesus died on the cross and rose again to cleanse us, to clean us of our sins, because God wants us to understand compassion and to being kind-hearted and to forgiving people. So I want you to remember that. When someone maybe hurts you a little bit, forgive them. God forgives us so much, we can certainly forgive somebody, all right? So I want you to practice that, forgiving and compassion and being kind-hearted. Ready to say our prayer? All right, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. Help me to be forgiving. Help me to be compassionate. I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. Now go and be forgiving. All right, bye. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that message with us. Uh, it's time for our uh, sermon. And uh, just so everybody's up to speed, uh, uh, we are in chapter three out of four in the story of Jonah. And uh, I just want to give us all a recap um, because there's a lot of things happening in the story and we don't want to get lost or start off track. So we're all going to catch up together, whether we've read the story already or not. So Jonah is a prophet who has been chosen by God to go off to a very wicked, evil city called Nineveh. And God wants those people to know through Jonah that they need to stop being evil and repent. Otherwise they would be destroyed. And so Jonah says what nobody thought would be possible, right? He, he says to God, eh, no, I don't want to do that. And we don't know why he says that. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, these people, the people of Nineveh, are enemies of God's people, right? There are very a strong military force. They are not good to other people. They could invade at any point in time. So why wouldn't you uh, want them to, to repent and to turn towards God so that there can be peace. You know, there's a lot of reasons why uh, we're not quite sure what's going on in Jonah's head, but we do know that he just refuses. So rather than going to Nineveh, he gets on a boat and he sails the opposite direction, but God then sends a storm, a great storm that almost kills Jonah and the others that are on board. Now, everybody's freaking out on the boat and Jonah says, listen, uh, this is my God who's causing the storm. He is the God of the land and of the sea. He controls the wind and the waves. He's, he's doing this because I'm not doing what he says. So I'll tell you what, why don't you guys just throw me overboard, just toss me overboard, and then I'll die. And then you guys will be fine because the storm will stop. I won't be on your boat anymore. Uh, so let, let's just go ahead and do that. God's only after me. And these poor men, they actually repent and they turn to God and they worship him and they say, God, please don't let this man's uh, blood be on our hands. We don't want to do this, but we're not quite sure what else to do. So they throw him overboard. And so there Jonah is and he treads water and treads water some more. And then he starts drowning and he's struggling. He's getting tired. He's gasping for air. And eventually he gets too weak and, and he starts to sink. And he's got his last breath and he's desperate. He, he doesn't think he can go any longer. He's going to die. And so he calls out to God. He reaches out and turns to him for help. And so God sends a giant fish that swallows Jonah. 
And Jonah is in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights. And during that time, he has a lot of time to reflect. And he sings this song to God. He, he, he sends up this prayer that essentially says this, God, you could have let me die, but you didn't. Instead, you saved me, even though I was disobedient, even though I still don't want to go to Nineveh, I will go because you are so good. And then the fish graciously vomits Jonah back onto land. And that's where our scripture starts for today. Now, God calls on Jonah a second time and he gives him his mission. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, if you remember or not, notice that the call hasn't changed. The mission hasn't changed. God is saying the same thing to Jonah as he did in the beginning, but Jonah is different. He has realized that even though he disagrees with God, he still needs to follow God and trust him. And so at this time, Jonah obeys and he makes his way to Nineveh, that evil, wicked city. But it takes about a month or a month and a half of a journey to get from where he was spit out to Nineveh. And so in that time, Jonah has a little more time to reflect, right? He is not close to death anymore. He, you know, he's, he's fine. He's safe. And so he's thinking, you know what? I know I agreed. I know I would go, you know, I said I would go to Nineveh. So now I have to do it, but I still don't want to. Ugh. So what he does is he goes to Nineveh and he preaches a sermon, but it is the shortest probably laziest sermon that we could ever think of. It's a little underwhelming to say the least. Now imagine you came to church and I were to preach a sermon that was eight words long and then just leave. Now, some of you might be thinking, great, and we can leave early too. No, most of you would probably thinking, um, well, where's the rest of the sermon? Isn't he going to explain those things? Isn't he going to elaborate or help us understand what God is saying and, and how we can do these things and understand better? And well, of course you would. That would be what a reasonable person would be thinking for good reason. Preachers are supposed to put in more effort than that, aren't they? But because Jonah is so reluctant to do what God says, he does the bare minimum that he said he would. And we can tell by how short it is that the sermon is almost crafted to be ineffective. I think the only way jo uh, Jonah's sermon could have been more careless is if he would have ended it with the words, or whatever, right? But despite Jonah's worst efforts, the people of Nineveh, the wicked, evil people, they repent. And the king himself issues a decree for everyone to repent. And so maybe you're not familiar with that word, but to repent means that we, uh, we come to realize that the way that we've been living and the things that we've been doing have been against what God wants for us and from us. And we're sorry for it. And we turn to God and we ask him to forgive us, right? But not only are we sorry, but we also want to turn away from our sin and say, God, you know what? I want to do it your way. I want to do it the right way. I want to do it the way that's best for me and for the people around me. And that gives you glory and honor, right? So that's repentance. And these people repent. And the king issues this decree for everybody else in the kingdom, in the city to repent as well. And in the ancient Middle East, they would repent and outwardly show it by dressing in what's called sackcloth. Now it's quite you know, obvious to some, but by the, the way that it's named, it's the cloth that's used to make like a sack, like an old scratchy potato sack that you would jump in in those potato sack hop races. It's scratchy, it's uncomfortable, and they would just, you know, cut two holes in them and put their arms through, and that's what they would wear. Um, and it's like a coarse burlap, right? And then they would cover their skin, their heads in ashes, and they would fast, meaning that they wouldn't eat or drink anything for a time. And they are showing God that they are sorry for mourning and that they're mourning their wickedness and they're depriving themselves in this way to, to really let God know. And that seems kind of a weird thing to do, 
but it's, it's not that strange. And we still kind of do that in some ways, right? You know, when you're in real trouble, right? You'll have these gestures to make up for it. Maybe in, in marriage or in a relationship, you're in the doghouse, right? And that could be men or women. Doghouse is for everybody. Um, if you do something um, that, that hurts your spouse, your partner, um, you're going to want to go that extra mile, right? Maybe a surprise date or a gift or, or something like that. Maybe you do all the chores. Or if at work you, you mess up or you're late all the time, you get a, a warning. Well, you're going to make sure that your work is going to be really good and thorough and maybe you hand it in early, those kinds of things. Or what if you're, you've had a bad day and your kids are arguing with you or someone else's kids and you find yourself just being really nasty to the kids and you realize and you go, oh man, well, we've all had those moments where all of a sudden we're, oh, let's all go get ice cream, right? Um, just to show how sorry we are and, and those things. So when we mess up and we're sorry, we want to show people that we are sorry. We want to outwardly show that. And so this part of ancient culture, although it seems weird, it really isn't that unrelatable, all right? So they do all of this, and here is the reason that they do it, because maybe God will relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will not cause us to perish, right? Maybe this will actually work. And even the wicked Ninevites are aware or have at least heard of or are, are, are becoming, um, becoming more aware of God's compassion and his mercy towards those who repent and seek him. But this is all really, really strange, isn't it? And in fact, the deeper we get into the story, the more we begin to learn that all of the roles are reversed. Nobody in this story is doing what they are stereotypically supposed to do. Um, and in, um, in, in literature, the style of this story would be classified as a satire, right? Uh, everything is kind of flipped. Nothing is what you'd expect it to be. There's a great amount of irony in it. It's almost funny, isn't it? Uh, but it is goofy. Not only does God's own prophet reject God and go against him and disobey him and refuse to do his work, but you know, as the one person who really should be, but all of the people who should oppose God actually turn to him in faith and repent. You have the foreign sailors, right? The pagans who worshiped all of these different gods. Well, they turn to God and worship him and repent and pray to him. You've got the people of Nineveh who are like the wicked, most evil people that you could imagine at the time. And they repent. And just for like comedic effect, just the extra cherry on top, even the animals, even the cows, the sheep, the donkeys, uh, the oxen, they repent, they put on sackcloth. And so you got to be thinking, what is going on in this story? And so, so they repent, everybody who's not supposed to repent does it. And oh my goodness, it actually works. Can you believe that? So maybe the God of Israel actually is compassionate. Maybe he is really willing to turn from his anger and to relent so that we will not perish. And so what we see here is Jonah, like many characters in the Bible before, he's doing a kind of like a, a wily e. coyote thing from Roadrunner, right? Where he's trying his best to sabotage God's plan and he's setting up all of these traps and all that, but it ends up blowing up in his face and uh, God's plan comes to a fruition anyway, just like you know, Roadrunner always gets the seed at the end of, uh, of, the, of the plot. And, uh, you know, that's actually a really, really good thing, because now an entire city of people, an entire metropolitan has turned to God, a, a people that were dead, as good as dead in their sin, they are now repentant, and they are spared, and God has given them life, and we got to think, uh, imagine if, you know, you were to go to New York and you're like, hey, everybody, you got to repent or God's going to destroy all of you. And the whole city of New York, saying nothing about New York, right, or the people in there, it, just imagine the size of that metropolitan compared to these days, right? And everybody, every single person and animal repented. That's amazing news. 
despite Jonah's best efforts. And so we've got to say, that's great, Jonah, you miserable, miserable guy. And now we don't know what Jonah's problem is yet. God hasn't revealed it to us yet uh, in this portion of the story. We don't know why he's so reluctant or why he's being such a pain. Actually, we will find out though next week. And that's going to put a whole new twist on this whole story and tell us the actual overarching meaning of everything. But for now, we don't need to know why Jonah is being such a mess yet because it's not important quite yet. We have so much uh, and, and quite enough to learn without knowing that yet, just by what God has showed us in this story. There are two things, among many things, that I'd like you to take away from this uh, part of the story today. The first one is uh, God's plan cannot be thwarted or stopped, right? Um, here, it says in the scripture in Job, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. And then in Isaiah, we read, for the Lord Almighty has purposed and who can thwart him? This hand is stretched out. Uh, his hand is stretched out. And who can turn it back? And the answer is no one, nobody. And in this whole story, we've experienced that that's the truth. Whether it's Jonah saying no, whether it's him trying to run away, whether it's him and his low efforts, whatever Jonah has been trying, it's not effective in stopping what God has said would happen from the very beginning of the story. No one messes up the Almighty's plans. Now, we have many examples in scripture, but you can probably think of a few uh, instances in, in your life, whether it was you or somebody around you, right? Now, the devil thought that he could, uh, you know, trick mankind into crucifying the Savior and that, oh, it'll, it'll all work out and, oh, I'll get him. But how did that work out, right? Jesus is exalted. He's overcome death and, and everything totally backfired, right? Through the history of the church, persecutors thought that they could stop God and his people by wiping them out. But how does that work out? And how does it work out still to this day, right? <laughs> Not very well. God's kingdom is flourishing and has flourished since. Now, Jonah does the bare minimum to sabotage God's message. But how did that work out? And then finally, you and me, um, we are clumsy. We are sinful. We make mistakes all the time. Um, and even when we try our best, we still make mistakes, especially when we try to talk to others about Jesus or, or display the Christian life in, in the ways that we live. But how does that work out, right? God still works through us. And so my point here is nobody, whether against God or for God, can mess with his plan, okay? Now that should teach us not to fear others as much, right? Nobody can stop God's plan. People are powerless, uh, powerless compared to God uh, once his will and his mind is made up. So we don't have to be as afraid, but also we can have more confidence in reaching out and spreading the message of the gospel because honestly, it doesn't get much worse than the people of Nineveh and it doesn't get much worse than the prophet Jonah. And even if you're wrong about something, uh, God can still use that somehow. But the thing here is we can't just sit on the sidelines being paralyzed about, oh, our enemy is going to beat us up. The other team is going to get us so bad. Or oh, what use am I going to be in the game? I'm probably just going to make a mistake and ruin it for everybody. No, 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 no. We can't let fear sideline us. God is calling us to go, to preach, to live in a way that points to him always. Don't be afraid. God's plan will come to fruition, right? And it's important for us to actually know what God's plan is. And so we should spell it out. God's plan, as we see here, is for the Gentiles, for the strangers, for the foreigners, for the sinners, for the worst of the worst, for those who are most unlike us, as we can imagine, to turn to him and to repent and to be saved by faith. And we see a glimpse of that here. This is just one example in the story. But knowing the whole scripture, we see that much more fully, don't we? When Jesus dies for the people of this world, you, me, Jews, and Gentiles alike, 
And the gospel is carried all over the world. God has mercy and compassion for all who repent. No one is too far gone. Not the sailors, not Jonah, not Nineveh, not you, not me, nor anybody else in our world right now. By faith and by the blood of Jesus, God has made a way for everyone to be saved. He desires for everyone to be saved. The second point that I want you to know, um, first, right, God's plan cannot be thwarted. And the second one is that God is the one at work always. It becomes pretty apparent that Jonah is not the best prophet, right? Jonah did not have what it takes to bring people to God. From his shameful attitude to his lame sermon, Jonah doesn't get any credit here. Why would he? Neither did the evil, wicked, deplorable people of Nineveh have it in them to come to God and have faith and repent on their own. God is doing everything. And we find the same thing today, though, don't we? Us pastors, we have no strength. We have no special ability. We have no power of our own. But God uses us broken and sinful people as mouthpieces to preach his word. And as Christians, we don't come to faith on our own, nor is it by our own efforts or our own logic or reasoning that we can stay in the faith. But we believe that it's the Holy Spirit, the work of God that gives and sustains our faith. And so in our catechism, the Luther small catechism, maybe you've received one at your confirmation, maybe you had one and don't, or you never got one, but if you're interested in one, please let me know, email or call. Uh, it's the basics of the Christian teachings and some questions and answers to help explain those. And here's what we read in the section of the Apostles' Creed where it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, Martin Luther says, what does this mean? And I want you to actually read this with me at home. Don't just hear me, but actually read it with me. Here we go. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. This is what we believe about the Holy Spirit and about faith, that even our faith, even our repentance, even when we come to God, that's all God working in us. So today we find ourselves as children of a God whose plan to save the world is good and perfect and cannot be stopped. But we also find ourselves as servants of a God who has promised to do everything for us and through us by his power, not ours. Today's scripture is just one example of all of this, right? So let's turn to God in trust and in faith and join him in his mission and witness many more examples through us and in our lives as God works through us to bring the world to himself. This is God's word for the day. Amen. Now, having heard about repentance and turning towards God, we now have a chance to do it ourselves in a moment of confession. Uh, and this is, as I said before, us realizing and coming to terms, confronting the fact um, that we are sinful, that we haven't followed God perfectly. We've rebelled against him. We've ignored him. And it's led to all this hurt and destruction and pain. Uh, and it's not led to God's glory. And so throughout the week, we're supposed to repent on a daily basis, but it can really get away from us. That's why it's so important for us to come together as a church and to repent together. And so I'm going to lead us in a prayer of repentance, followed by a moment of silence where we can reflect and pray personally, individually to God, knowing what sins we've committed and ask for his help, and then followed by a word of forgiveness. So let's enter into that time of confession right now. O oh, gracious God of peace, Father of mercy, God of all comfort, we confess before you the evil of our hearts. We acknowledge that we are too inclined toward anger, jealousy, and revenge, to ambition and pride, which often give rise to discord 
and bitter feelings between others and us. Too often we've thus both offended and grieved you, O long-suffering Father. Forgive us this sin and for, uh, permit us to partake of the blessing that you have promised the peacemakers who shall be called the children of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just as the Ninevites were sinful people and Jonah was a sinful person, so you and I are also sinful, disobedient, miserable people as we sin against God. But just like the Ninevites, just like Jonah, God pursues us. God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't just leave us to die in our sin, but he pursues us actually so fervently as to send his own son, Jesus Christ, to this world to become a man like us, to humble himself, uh, to die and to be raised again, so that Jesus could free us on, by overcoming sin, death, and the devil by the power of his blood. We are free. And so it is by that death and resurrection and by the faith that he's called you to and upon your repentance and confession that I can tell you with confidence that you are forgiven in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now as God's a beloved and forgiven people, uh, we draw near to him and lift up all of our needs, uh, whether it's personal needs or of the church, of our brothers and sisters, of our country, of our world. We lift it all up to God. Uh, would you, uh, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for the fact that we are included in your plan, that you haven't given up on us, that you haven't sentenced us to death, but you have pursued us, um, and that your love for us is just so tremendous, inconceivable. Lord, keep us strong in the faith by the power of your Holy Spirit, and bring us always not only to repentance, but with a, a joy for spreading your word, for spreading your gospel and sharing the salvation that we have with those around us. Help us to trust in your power and your strength as you equip us and send us to do so. Lord, we give you thanks as well for the 25th wedding anniversary of Rob and Julie Osborne. And uh, we pray for uh, Thanksgiving for Bob and Sharon Henchen's new grandchild, Leon. Uh, thank you for that birth, that new life. And would you lead Leon quickly to the waters of baptism? We pray for guidance in filling vacant staff positions here at St. Matthew, and uh, we also want to lift up persecuted Christians all around the world, and specifically today in Pakistan. Lord, would you be with them and give them relief from their persecution if it is your will, but most importantly, help them to stay firm in the midst of it uh, for the sake of the gospel. We pray for Tom and Ann Bennett, two of our homebound members in the congregation. Would you uh, give them the peace of your presence always? And also encourage us as your uh, church to reach out to them and to spend time and care for them in love and fellowship. Lord, uh, we pray for our government. We lift up our leaders to make wise and righteous and just decisions. You have called them and you have appointed them. Now, Lord, work through them um, and let your will be done uh, as, they, uh, as they work in the positions that you've placed them in. Lord, we pray for those who are sick or hospitalized, those who are suffering currently, including Shelly and Paul and Mallory, for Nancy Greer, Braden Breeding, Joyce Shonchek and Andy Snook, for Denise and Howard, for the mother of Amy, and Lord, for all of those as well who currently have COVID or are experiencing recovery issues from COVID. Lord, heal them all in body and soul and in mind, according to your will and in their suffering. Draw them close to you and trust and hope. Lord, we lift up those as well who are grieving, those who are suffering a loss. And we lift up the family and friends of Dan Kleinedler's brother-in-law, Scott, 
And we also lift up Marie and Dave and the rest of their family as they grieve the loss of John. God, give them a peace that can only come from you. Um, heal their broken hearts, bind up their wounds, and remind them of the resurrection that is to come when you make all things new and that we will see our departed brothers and sisters in the faith um, when you come again and bring your kingdom to us fully. Lord, all of these things uh, we lift up to you and uh, we pray them with confidence knowing that you hear us as we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of God came to Jonah. The word of God comes to us. Go despite your fears. Speak the truth of God and love your neighbor and your enemy. Forgive as you have been forgiven. Receive grace upon grace overflowing from the fullness of God. We will go, speak, love, forgive, and receive, trusting in God's promise and blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We now have a closing song, but after that, we have some important announcements to the congregation. So please, after the song, stay on and we'll have those announcements. They're, they're pretty brief, but they're very important. So we'll see you in just a few moments. I was buried beneath my shame.
All right. As promised, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first of all, thank you, Taylor family, uh, for providing music. Uh, wonderful, wonderful job uh, today. It's a joy to have you here. Um, guests, it's good uh, to have you with us today. If you uh, need any help along in your way, on uh, your journey with Jesus, if you want to be introduced or you know you have any questions, always please reach out to us at hello at st-matthew.org, and we would be delighted to assist you in that and walk with you. Now, here's the big one. St. Matthew Lutheran Church will be holding a teacher call meeting on Sunday, July 25th at 1 p.m. We have two highly qualified candidates uh, that the Lord has brought to us, Mrs. Angie Geary and Mrs. Kelsey Heath. Now, voting members of St. Matthew Lutheran Church are encouraged to join this meeting uh, and allow for the Holy Spirit to use each member and attendance to discern the Lord's will regarding uh, this position and who he wants to serve in this role. So the details of this meeting are going to be sent through this week's uh, St. Matthew E-News. So um, keep, um, keep your eyes out for that. And uh, remember, Sunday, the 25th, 1 p.m., details to follow. Then we've got Bible study as usual at 1045 right here on Zoom uh, in just 25 minutes. And it's really important for us to be engaged in Bible study. Uh, we've all been in the pandemic. We've been in our homes, all those things, but we have a chance and an opportunity and an obligation uh, to come and experience community with brothers and sisters in Christ, to be in God's word intentionally. Uh, and it's also just a great time. So I encourage you, all the email is on, uh, uh, sorry, all the information is on our website, on the Bible study tab, including um, you know handouts, study guides, previous recordings, the Zoom link, everything like that. So I hope to see you there in just a little bit. Uh, thank you for your ongoing support of the ministry. You can continue to give or uh, give one time um, at uh, st-matthew.org slash give. And then finally, um, we've got uh, five minutes of Zoom chat. So stick around and enjoy that. And we'll see you uh, in one week. Be blessed and be safe, everybody. Bye-bye.